Hi, I'm Tom Pollard. I'm a dean of the graduate school. I'm a biologist. And uh, welcome to our series uh, uh, for 2014, the Company of Scholars Lectures, which is a series of lectures that the graduate, graduate school sponsors to uh, uh, provide to the community uh, some lectures of general interest on many different topics. Uh, David Evans, our speaker today, uh, was known to me as a fabulous university citizen because I knew him from promotions committees and other virtuous activities that he was engaged in. Uh, and then suddenly, a couple of years ago, he had this very high-profile paper in Nature uh, that got in the newspaper and so on. And it, it, uh, I was suddenly aware of the very, very interesting work he was do doing, which, which he's going to talk about today. Because uh, I think we all know that the continents have been drifting around on the surface of the Earth, but what he and his friends managed to do is figure out where they're headed, mm -hmm. which is pretty, pretty interesting, <laughs> and because uh, it's going to have a big impact on all forms of life on, on Earth, as you'll hear in the lecture. <clears throat> so this is the first of uh, three uh, lectures we're having. The second one is by Susan Hyde from the Political Science Department, which is on March 25th. Uh, she does uh, research on, on elections, and her topic's going to be, uh, does democracy promotion promote democracy? Interesting question. And uh, then Gary Tomlinson, who's sitting right back here, is going to speak on the uh, 16th of April about uh, one a million years of music, which sounds like another fascinating topic. Uh, looking back in time like our speaker today, and perhaps forward, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, D David uh, is the Yale College graduate and uh, got his PhD at Caltech and did a postdoc in Australia where he was working on some of the same things that he's talking about today, I believe. He uh, joined our faculty here in the Department of Geology and Geophysics in 2002 and was promoted to associate professor in 2007 and full professor in 2009. And you can see his title before you. David, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming today. Um, I will be stepping away from the podium, so I hope you can hear me in the back. Good, excellent. And I imagine that a catchy title such as this, as this may have drawn um, a, more of a broad crowd in Yale, and I hope that's the case, and I hope to intrigue you not only for the portion of my research, which will occupy the middle of the talk, uh, the first um, two-thirds of the talk, but also some speculations here at the end on what a geologist, not all geologists, but a geologist's perspective, mine, on the ultimate fate of humankind. So we are going to begin, actually, with some audience participation. And I'm very curious what your views are in terms of where humanity will be 50,000 years from now. And so if you have an internet mobile device, you can go to this website, polev.com slash majestic, or you can um, uh, text uh, 22333 um, and um, submit your answer to um, this multiple choice question. There is no right answer. Um, this is far in the future. Um, but where do you think humans will be 50,000 years from now? Um, we have various options. We have natural extinction at the top. The first four are extinctions, the, the last two are survival. Na uh, the votes are coming in. Natural extinction, which might be a meteor impact or a supernova blast or a pandemic um, disease. We have man-made extinction, maybe nuclear holocaust. We have extinction or transmutation by religious apocalypse, think the second coming, if you will. Um, conquest or annihilation by extraterrestrial um, civilizations. And then the last two are um, what I imagine very, very broadly what a possible maybe optimistic scenario might be. Would we have a sustainable existence that's confined to Earth and perhaps just the inner solar system, the rocky planets, uh, the moon and Mars, but maybe just Earth, or the Star Trek solution, which is expansion into deep space? So I'll give you a minute or two to register some more votes. If you are joining us um, from the uh, cyberspace, the cyber universe on the streaming, I also, your uh, votes should also count here. So. Um, as I watch some more votes come in, we have uh, more of a pessimistic crowd, perhaps, in the audience today, a few more optimists coming in. Um, but uh, what's interesting is that um, I, when I tried this on my students in uh, geology class I'm teaching now, 
Um, I got a lot of questions about what about uh, global warming and um, will that, uh, do you consider that to be natural or man-made? Actually, I left that up to the, uh, the audience. Um, <laughs> I think you will find, um, uh, maybe I'll come back to that issue. Personally, I don't think global warming is capable of causing the human extinction. It might make us um, uh, very uncomfortable. OK, so this poll will continue to go on. And um, we have more optimists. And we have somewhere between uh, a confinement to sustainable existence on Earth and the Star Trek solution um, registering there. So I'll, I'll return to this um, at the end and uh, register some of my opinions as they come in. So we put this in the background, and click it out, and here we go. So the talk will be in three parts. First, I am going to introduce to many of you, um, I'm assuming uh, no prior uh, advanced knowledge in geology, I'll give an introduction to geology and what we call deep time, millions of years or billions of years in the past. And then that will segue into my research, which is the past and the future motions of continents across the Earth's surface using the magnetism of rocks. And then finally, we'll, get to, we'll return to the subject of perhaps the ultimate fate of humankind. So to begin with, I will start with the concept of deep time and walk you through some of the most important events in the history of Earth and life on Earth from our perspective. And so the concept of deep time is one where you have to imagine a time scale. And the time scale uh, can be shown vertically or horizontally. You'll see both in this talk. But vertically, it extends from the bottom. In geology, we think of layers of sediment recording uh, events in Earth's history. So from the very bottom, 4,600 million years ago, the creation of the solar system, moving all the way up geological time and the evolution of land plants and reptiles and birds and dinosaurs to finally humans up to the very top. And this kind of figure is what you might find in any introductory geology textbook or many popular websites. But notice that the time scale that's employed is nonlinear. And what that means is that most of Earth history, 88% of Earth history, in fact, is shoved down here at the bottom because, frankly, we don't know a whole lot about it relative to how much more information we have from the re relatively recent geological past. And if we were to plot things appropriately in a linear time scale, that 88% of geological time, which is known as the Precambrian, that means prior to the Cambrian uh, radiation of animal life on Earth, this huge window of time is really my playground for research because um, there is recent technological innovations which have opened up the possibility of doing the research that I do in Precambrian time. And what I hope to show you is that uh, a lot of uh, our natural resources, and particularly our metal resources, uh, come from Precambrian rocks. And so part of the industrial society and the excellent lifestyle that we enjoy right now is based on a long history of processes that occurred in this time, which until relatively recently was somewhat mysterious to us. So let's start from the very beginning. And a little eye candy for you, um, a uh, simulation of the moon forming impact shortly after the initial accretion of the Earth and a companion body about, thought to be about the size of Mars that collided and ended up ejecting a whole lot of material from both bodies, much of which got fragmented and much of it was re-accreted to a very glowing hot um, Earth protoplanet some of it accreting in waves. And what you don't see in this image is the moon coming out at about 20 Earth radii away and forming from that initial event. So there's various ideas in current research about how this may actually have happened. But the giant impact theory is really the birth date of effectively uh, the Earth as we know it. Fast forward 1 billion years, 1,000 million years from that event. And we find the oldest tangible evidence of life on Earth. And it's a very humble evidence at that. These are called stromatolites. And they are found in places such as Western Australia and South Africa, uh, two of the oldest um, well-preserved areas uh, on our planet from this age. 3.4 GA and G stands for giga. A stands for anim, so a billion years ago, 3.4 billion years ago. We have the suggestion that biology contributed to making these conical layers, these conical structures, 
in the rocks. And then there is some debate, of course, about whether these are truly biological. If there is any scientific consensus, it is based on the comparison broadly between these forms and uh, similar forms today either in the, sub, uh, um, in the Bahamas underwater or as you can see if you drive a, a full day's drive north of Perth, Western Australia where I did my postdoc, you can go to Shark Bay and you can see these noble and humble creatures um, building these bio, uh, cyanobacterial mounds in the shallow um, sea. So this is the suggestion of the oldest life on Earth at about a billion years after the formation. From there, we can continue on with the tree of life. And the tree of life, as many of you know, if you're a biologist, has great, uh, three great super kingdoms. Uh, those are the eukaryotes, which include animals, plants, and fungi, as well as um, protists. Those of the bacteria, and those of archaea, which were thought to be bacteria for a long time until it was realized that, that archaea are as different from bacteria as we are. Um, but they are single-celled. and Various estimates based on geological chemical markers in, that are preserved in sedimentary rocks suggest the various ages for nodes of branching along the tree of life. Uh, we finally get up to animals here, and there we are. At the, at, of course, uh, we place ourselves at the top of this tree next to our closest evolutionary relatives, which are mushrooms and corn. So uh, this, I hope, gives you some perspective on the diversity of life on Earth and how small we multicellular creatures are in that kind of context. Another very, very important event, uh, fast forwarding again another billion years. Uh, in this case, now we're looking at a timeline which goes from four and a half billion years ago to the present, and we're looking at a plot of estimates of oxygen in the atmosphere. And today we have about 20% oxygen in the atmosphere. It's what we breathe to survive. But there was about the first half of Earth history when oxygen levels were vanishingly low. And this is a logarithmic scale, so each tick is a tenth less, a 10% of the tick above it, of the oxygen concentration. So here we are at present with about 20% um, atmospheric oxygen. But you go back about a, a half a billion to a billion years, and you might be looking at 1% of that fraction. And before that, even less. And obviously, advanced life as we know it, ourselves, could not exist without the evolutionary innovation of oxygenic photosynthesis um, within, um, within, uh, within the life, uh, the life domain, to produce O2 as a waste product, and then the rest of life had to respond to this abrupt rise. So this is one of the major uh, events in life history. Now, we go forward another billion and a half years, and we get to a concept which is called Snowball Earth, and Snowball Earth is um, the concept and the hypothesis, which is gaining support uh, through the years, I think, which is that the Earth on at least two occasions and perhaps as many as five occasions around um, 600 to 800 million years ago completely froze over and froze over for as long as a few million years at a time. Life would have needed to exist, um, we know, because we have the antiquity of of the, um, of the fossils um, with extant um, micro microbial organisms. Life would have had to exist under the ice, but it was very, very extreme challenges. And in fact, some of the research that I do on the magnetism of rocks gives us indications that some of the ice deposits in these times were, were close to the equator of the Earth, and uh, by inference, the entire Earth should have been covered. But that would be a separate uh, talk in itself, um, or perhaps even a semester course on the snowball earth hypothesis. What I'm hoping to do just now is give you these insights, these little snapshots and important evolutionary events in earth history from a biological perspective, from the moon forming impact to the oldest tangible evidence of life in the stromatolites, to the rise of oxygen, to these globally engulfing ice ages. These all set the stage for the Cambrian radiation of animals that happened abruptly about 540 million years ago. Now, if we were to truly appreciate this amount of time, the four billion years of Earth history prior to the Cambrian radiation of animals, I find it instructive to make an analogy with a calendar year. So if we begin a calendar year on January 1st, we get to June before we have the oxygenation of the atmosphere. We get to mid-November before we have the Cambrian radiation of animals. And you can see these various other events which occurred in a more recent geological time, all basically happening in December. The large coal swamps on, De on the 1st of December. The largest extinction, the Permian-Triassic boundary, 250 million years ago. 
by this calendar analogy is on December 11th. The dinosaur extinction on Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. And then finally humans come along at, if you include our Australopithecine ancestors as uh, nominally human, uh, they show up at about 8, 10 p.m. on New Year's Eve. In fact, um, all of civilization, uh, let's, let's be generous and give ourselves 8,000 years of agrarian society, um, that, the technology that we use to become uh, an agrarian society, do things like uh, control yeast to um, ferment alcoholic beverages, that technology was invented 55 seconds before midnight, perhaps just in time, you might say. <laughs> okay, so with that introduction to broad expanses of geological time, um, I'm going to shift gears and tell you a little bit about the dynamic motions of the Earth's surface and interior. And to appreciate that we have plates on the Earth, we can find this animation of earthquakes happening within a three and a half decade interval from the latter half of the last century. And this is just passive recording and location from a series of seismic networks around the world of where the earthquakes are happening. And as time moves on, it becomes clear that the, Earth is, the Earth's surface is divided into a series of internally mostly rigid plates where there are no earthquake epicenters, separated by relatively narrow zones of lots of earthquakes. And this is the surface expression of motions in the interior of the Earth, which are helping the planet release its heat to space. Um, and again, it's a fascinating subject in itself. But for my purposes, I'm interested in tracking the long-term history <coughs> of the motions of those continents as allowed by the presence of these plate boundaries that allow the relative motion of these large tectonic plates, which are internally rigid. So this is where, how a geologist would look at the map of the world and see the plate boundaries. Each plate is shown in a different color. Some plates are entirely oceanic in character. Some plates have <coughs> carry continents with them. And notice that the edge of the continent is not necessarily a plate boundary, as we have, for example, right here in Connecticut. So for this reason, we don't have major earthquakes where we are at the edge of this um, side of the continent. And yet California and Alaska have um, earthquakes at the edge of that side of the continent because that side of the continent coincides with a tectonic plate boundary. So with that introduction to the Earth system, both in time and space, I can now tell you a little bit about my research. I'm sure many of you have heard about the supercontinent known as Pangaea, which broke apart, started to break apart about 200 million years ago. At that time, the time, initial time of breakup, uh, a position that's close to us here in Connecticut was within perhaps uh, a long uh, journey, walking distance from Morocco and the Western Sahara. And, sorry, when in the last um, 200 million years, we had a rift system that spread North America away from Africa, and in doing so, ha opened up the Atlantic Ocean and carried us farther and farther away, not only from our initial counterpart position in Morocco, but also far and far away from this tectonically active mid-ocean ridge, thereby allowing us to live in a tectonically quiescent environment today. So but this, this kind of animation is it's, it's actually relatively easy to do. And it was first done in the 1960s. And it was made possible because of magnetic variations that were observed by ships towing magnetometers across the surface of the ocean. And we could, as soon as we understood the structure of the ocean, of the seafloor, the ocean basin, we were able to, in a sense, replay the movie backwards and draw this new ocean lithosphere back down the ridge to go backwards in time. So this, the solution of the Pangaea puzzle is a relatively simple one by tectonic terms. And uh, to give you a, a sense of, of the kind of geological structures that that rifting has left behind in Connecticut for, for your local amusement, um, we can look at the geological map of Connecticut, which was most recently compiled by a very famous uh, Yale um, geology professor named John Rogers. And what you see in here are every color represents a different rock type. Um, across the state. And so you can go from one place to another, and you can draw a map, and you know where you are, and you find a rock type that's, 
that's distinctive, and um, you plot your position on the map, and you can trace these rock types around. And the red, in this case, corresponds with igneous rocks. These are typically volcanic rocks, and they are associated with that tearing apart of the crust 200 million years ago. Such rocks include West Rock, and East Rock, and Sleeping Giant, and the Hanging Hills of Meriden. These are direct products of that tearing apart of the crust 200 million years ago. They are embedded within a series of sedimentary rocks that were formed in a great rift valley. So if you imagine what Connecticut was like 200 million years ago, you can think about going to East Africa today and seeing a big rift valley pulling apart. On either side of the central rift valley, we have what we call the, the western highlands of Connecticut and the eastern highlands of Connecticut. Highlands in a relative sense, of course. Um, and in these areas, the geology has patterns that swirls around as if it was, it was taken in a butter churn and swirled around, or in a mixing pot of doughy bread. And that's exactly what happened uh, 100 million years prior to the rifting, because Connecticut was the site of a great collision zone. Looking at the geological map of Connecticut in a much larger context, of course, geology knows no political boundaries. So we can extend the central rift basin into central Massachusetts, and it dies out right around the Vermont-New Hampshire border. There's an equivalent basin throughout most of New Jersey, one in Gettysburg, and a series of these cracks in the earth that failed to develop into an oceanic rift. Uh, however, you can see, aside from those rift valleys, all these bright colors of greens and purples and pinks and oranges. These show what's called a tectonic fabric, a, uh, an organization of the rocks, which you can almost imagine looks like someone took a carpet and rucked it up and we're looking at the great corrugations of folds uh, across the Appalachians. And that's what we think actually happened about 300 million years ago when what was before in West Africa collided with what was in North America. So we had the continents colliding at 300 million years ago and tearing apart at 200 million years ago. So the supercontinent Pangaea existed for that 100 million years. And during that time, we would have expected the site of Connecticut to be truly a great mountain range, something like the Himalayas. If we imagine uh, an artist's conception of a cross-section of the mountain range that created uh, the Appalachians, you see all those swirly patterns that you saw expressed in the geological map of Connecticut and New England, and you can almost imagine the movie that must have occurred to produce the compression on this cross-section and the landscape that may have existed at that time. So if we now go globally outward and think about what Pangaea looks like from the perspective of its constituent elements, we can identify within a Pangaea base map uh, the ancient continent of North America plus Greenland, which is colored in yellow, and the ancient portion of Africa, which is colored in brown. It's called the West African block or craton and various other pieces of either South America or Central and Southern Africa or India, Antarctica, Australia, as well as Northern Europe and Siberia. And the Pangaea continent is composed, according to lots of geological studies that have mapped the areas and recognized compatibilities of geology from one region to the other, it is composed of a series of building blocks which did all collide and come together. And that is represented on this map by these black regions with the red outline. Those are the collision belts, the great mountain ranges that welded Pangaea. If we were to remove those, we can now see the building blocks that we would like to put together in an arrangement that existed prior to Pangaea. And that is the principal puzzle that I'm trying to solve in my research. Where was West Africa relative not only to North America, but relative to Amazonia? relative to the Congo block, or Congo craton, relative to the Southern African block, or called the Kalahari craton. There are about 13 pieces in this puzzle. And since I've been doing puzzles since I was, before I could speak, basically, uh, I find this to be an extremely frustrating puzzle, because with only 13 pieces, how is it that we cannot solve this so easily? Part of the problem is that um, the picture on the puzzle has been smeared, has been partly erased by subsequent geological events. And of course, there is no box uh, by which we can see the answer to that puzzle. 
as well as a lot of these collisions have tended to wear down the jigsaw locking um, edges. So it's not as simple as a jigsaw puzzle, but we are making some progress um, one piece at a time. And the way we are making that progress is by looking at the magnetization of rocks and realizing and appreciating the fact that Earth's magnetic field, which is generated in the outer core of the Earth from the liquid motions in the outer core, sends off field lines that go through the Earth's surface and out to space and back through the Earth's surface and back into the, the interior of the planet. Those field lines have a very consistent relationship with the geographic latitude of an observer anywhere on the surface of the Earth. And that relationship is such that qualitatively, if you are at the North Pole, the magnetic field lines are straight down. If you're at the South Pole, if you're standing at the South Pole and looking upside down in this figure, it looks like the field lines are coming straight out of the ground, going upward. And if you're on the equator, the field lines are tangential to the Earth, or they look like they're going, pointing straight flat to the north. And the angle of intersection, that vertical angle of intersection between the Earth's surface and these field lines, very systematically, according to this formula, where I is that vertical angle, we call it the inclination, and lambda stands for the latitude on the surface of the Earth and a couple of trigonometric functions, and that allows us to take a rock sample that formed many millions of years ago, understand that the geologic context in which that sample was taken, such that, for example, if it's in a series of sedimentary layers or volcanic layers, we know that those form horizontally, and therefore they formed a nice approximation of the Earth's surface, measure the magnetic direction in those samples, and therefore obtain this inclination, and from that we can infer the latitudes. So this information is what we will use to draw maps of the ancient world one block at a time and many, many ages at one time. So we need to go into the field and collect a lot of rocks from a lot of different ages. I'm usually asked by lay audiences, how do you know where to go? And the answer is um, all of those geological maps that had each color for the different rock types those are done not only at the scale of the state of Connecticut, but also quadrangle scales. They can be very detailed maps. Um, and uh, with the information that's obtained independently for dating the rocks, we can target where precisely we want to go, whether it's here in the Australian outback or anywhere else in the world, to collect our samples. When we do collect our samples, um, we can do it by uh, using a hammer. But the more fun and interesting way is to have a portable rock drill, which is essentially a chainsaw, which we've modified to have a diamond bit um, drill bit on the end. And we drill out a little core sample. And before we break that core sample out from the rock, uh, we can put in a specialized orientation device um, in, this, in, the, um, in the rock when the sample is still inside. And we can measure both the horizontal azimuth of that core and the vertical angle of that core. So we can orient this rock sample that we collected, whether in Australia or anywhere else, and then when we take it back in, and put it in my laboratory, we can use the computer to rotate those directions into their field coordinates. The data look like this. And I won't belabor that point other than to um, suggest that uh, this is, in fact, actually quite a complicated process um, requiring some, some art to being able to understand the data that we um, obtain, especially in very old rocks. My laboratory where the measurements are done looks like this. And we have an automatic system where each of these little gray cylinders is a slice of one of those cores that we drilled in the field. Each one of these is placed on the tray with an orientation mark, which is lined up with the 3D axes of our instrument. And um, the sample is picked up by a vacuum uh, motor and um, carried, um, held in place by suction while the chain rotates to a hole, drops it down. And just off the picture here is a very, very sensitive magnetometer that can analyze the magnetic strength not only in what you might think is strongly magnetized materials, uh, but also just everyday rocks. Um, it was once said when these were first invented in the 1970s, this level of magnetometer, that you could measure the magnetic direction in an apple core. And then, of course, in Australia, they actually did that experiment and measured the, um, the magnetic moment of an apple core. So we can take rocks or any materials that are 
not particularly magnetic, run-of-the-mill rocks that have interesting and well-known geological histories and measure their magnetic directions, obtain that vertical angle, and get the latitude. So then when we try to convert that into plotting the data onto a map, uh, I'm going to take you through a few minutes of this process. We can imagine looking down at the present North Pole, and I've taken away the other continents for simplicity, but here is a stylized map of the North American continent with the Great Lakes here, Hudson's Bay. And if a rock formed somewhere in the middle of North America, let's say close to Thunder Bay, Ontario, and um, it was magnetized as it formed today, then the magnetic direction here would um, be pointed like a compass needle toward the present North Pole, and that re relationship between the vertical angle and the horizontal Earth's surface would tell us the distance between the pole and the site. However, if we look at another rock, which perhaps may be from, say, the state of Wisconsin, which is, say, 450 million years old, and we take its magnetic directions uh, and we measure those, we can see not directions corresponding to today's field, but we see them in a deflected in a different direction. And this is, in fact, a representation of the actual data from 450 million year rocks in Wisconsin. And we can, through mathematical and geometrical manipulation, compute an ancient position of the pole relative to the site. And that ancient position of the pole is different from the present North Pole. And then the last step we need to do is if we are identifying the relative motion or relative position and location of a site and a pole, and if we want to reconstruct the continent now to its ancient latitude, you just do a rigid body rotation. You can imagine holding my arms as a, as a, as a rigid beam here, and we're going to shift the continent and this magnetic pole, shift it over until the ancient magnetic pole reaches the present North Pole. And that, sh that same shift that I applied to the continent gives rise to a reconstructed position of the continent, which at that time lay along the Paleo Equator. And I've added, the pole yes, uh, assuming always that the geomagnetic uh, dipole axis is parallel to the rotation axis. And that is a fascinating subject of discussion. Um, all of the tests that we have given that assumption have passed to within about 5% accuracy. Um, when we average over a few thousand years and if of the time, and if we um, are willing to allow the freedom of, of not knowing a priori whether the magnetic pole that we're pointing to is a North Pole or a South Pole due to the fact that the magnetic field reverses occasionally. Thank you for that point of clarification. So, we can say from these directions that the ancestral continent of North America lay along the Paleo Equator. We call it Laurentia. We know it was joined with another continent of Northern Europe called Baltica. And um, that is essentially how uh, we go about doing these reconstructions. Now, I'm going to take you back to the initial assembly of fragments of North America um, back about two billion years ago, almost half of the age of the Earth and show you some of the recent results from my laboratory that have given rise to a hypothesis, a model, um, that suggests that the current amalgam of North America, and for geographic reference, that is Lake Superior. This is the state of Minnesota, the 49 parallel border with US and Canada. And then much of the Canadian Shield is beautifully exposed ancient rock through Hudson's Bay and over toward Yellowknife Northwest Territories. And what you see on this map are a series of pieces, if you want to call them puzzle pieces, you can, separated by these red and green zones, which are thought to be the sites of vanished oceans that uh, closed along with the collision of all these blocks during the interval 1.9 to 1.8 billion years ago. Previous to our work, it was recognized that these suture zones, these tectonic suture zones, were the sites of vanished oceans that closed. But the previous, the prior configuration, uh, which even went as far as to name the oceans, Maniquin Ocean, Snowbird Rift, or Ocean, um, didn't really know how wide those oceans were. So what my colleagues and I did a synthesis um, in the last couple of years where we are presenting a hypothesis that is dealing with magnetic data 
And what we're looking at now is an animation of 400 million years of the assembly of North American continent. The ages in millions of years are um, shown up there, and so they're going by at a fairly rapid clip. Um, the, uh, ev the fragments of North America are color-coded um, to match the magnetic data, which are appearing as um, circles. Um, if we have done our job right, those magnetic data are plotting along the rotation axis. And um, you can see that the data are sparse, and we need to appeal to a lot of other information to estimate where these blocks were. Um, I'm going to point out one data point there, which is um, uh, not ours, but it's an, one from the literature which is fascinating and needs to be revisited. Um, if it's true, then we'll have to modify the model. But what you can see from this diagram is that we are um, accounting for all the blocks, uh, including, for example, Wyoming, which started off near where Wisconsin is and moves over um, to join Western Canada. And then Western Canada and Greenland assemble first, and then finally the, the portion of Eastern Canada comes in on the side at the end. And from this history of 400 million years, we have at least a working model now for the creation of the North American continent. And this take, took a lot of um, organization and there's special software to be able to do this. Um, and I'm sure it's wrong in many ways, but I'm very excited that we now have at least a template for further investigations. We've taken this now globally, and the fragments of North America, uh, now from time interval of 2100 million years, moving forward in time, the fragments of North America are plotted in the northern hemisphere and, and uh, upside down in your orientation um, for reasons we, we think that, that uh, we have various reasons to suggest that it was in the northern hemisphere at the time. Those are shown in yellow, and the other blocks of the world are color-coded according to what continent they form in now. And we can just imagine the millions of years going by as the current continents assemble for the first time. So we think a j offshore of northern Canada was, or were the fragments of what would eventually become Siberia. Portions of Australia, shown in blue, still yet to come together. Portions of South America in light green and Africa in red. India in purple, still in, and, and um, Asian blocks in purple, northern India, southern India, far away from each other. Once again, this kind of model is tied loosely by a series of data which are being plotted in the northern hemisphere there. There's a lot of room for improvement. But I'm, what I'm most excited about is, for the first time, our community is being able to assemble some templates by which we can really look and set up a global hypothesis for some of these motions. All right. This can go on for another 400 million years, but I think we should move along. <laughs> One of the key aspects of this interval of time in what we think was the assembly of the Earth's first supercontinent about 1.8 to 1.6 billion years ago, which has been called Nuna. That supercontinent is the assembly and the breakup of that supercontinent is known globally as, um, as occurring during a time of many, many mineral resources. And another part of the project that I'm very excited about is that we, in addition to our magnetic results and our simple polygons that we're moving around the surface of the Earth, we are also integrating our work with extensive databases of the ages of rocks and mineral deposits. And if you're a mineral expert, you'll recognize that nickel and copper and platinum group elements go together, that gold and copper sometimes go together, um, iron oxide, copper, gold, volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, load gold, unconformity uranium, Mississippi Valley type lead zinc, sediment, sedex, sedimentary copper. All of these now can potentially be mapped and charted and move around with our, our grid to be able to see where these deposits formed, not on today's present grid, but also, but more importantly, on the paleo grids and what was the tectonic environment. And these black symbols here are representations of where we think the ancient plate boundaries were that were accommodating these continental motions. So I'm very excited about this as an exploration tool for mineral deposits moving forward in time. And we will see this theme recurring as we think about long-term sustainability um, of our civilization. In fact, uh, I think many of you may have thought that if I'm 
talking about projecting continental motions far into the future, that that would have our bearing on the future of humankind. Actually, I think the more important aspect that, of our bearing on humankind is that the work we're doing in the ancient Earth to be able to locate many of these mineral resources. So finally, we will go to the future, and uh, we will talk about this paper that, to which Tom referred uh, the, in his introduction. Um, and that is the question of whether there will be another supercontinent. And we certainly have enough time left over to assemble uh, new continents. A part of the next supercontinent is already being created in the amalgam, which is Eastern Asia. India has collided with Asia already. Australia is moving north and shows no signs of stopping as it plows through New Guinea and ultimately the Philippines and ultimately Taiwan and Japan to collide with Eastern Siberia. Um, but what's less understood is whether, as a thought experiment, whether we might expect the, west, the current westward motion of the Americas to continue all the way across the Pacific and join Asia from, from that direction, or whether we expect the Atlantic Ocean to stop spreading and to turn around and become another collision zone in an accordion type of fashion of supercontinent cycle. Uh, cycle. Or in our paper, we made the, the alternative suggestion that the Americas have moved as far west as they are going to move and thereafter are only going to move north-south. Australia, we know, has moved as far east as it's going to move and has already begun moving north. And to explain the details of this would require another hour, um, but, so I won't, I won't go through that. But let's, I, one point I want to make is that this captured media attention because of the speculation and the broad thinking in terms of what could the world look like 50 to 100 or 250 million years ago. But in reality, the disclaimer is that that is all idle speculation and is not, in fact, science. If you, yes, it's a prediction, but if you set up an experiment that you need to wait 150 million years to see if it's verified, it's technically not really a scientific hypothesis. It was useful, however, as a thought experiment because um, it was our way of relating to people what we did find, which was science, which was a relationship between three ancient supercontinents and the two transitions between those ancient supercontinents where we did find motion that would be akin to the Atlantic stopping opening and akin to the Americas moving north-south and not going any further west and not turning around to the east. But again, to, to explain that in detail would require um, rather advanced topics, so I'll, I'll leave it there for now. But just for your amusement, we can see, according to our model, 150 million years into the future, Australia arriving and crunching up um, the rest of Eastern Asia, and our long-awaited uh, partners in South America joining us here in Connecticut. Um, and so this was the Amasia model that is not science. It literally took me about three minutes to arbitrarily put these uh, maps together. But they are a good way of thinking about where we sit relative to a long succession of supercontinents that may be coming and going. And the work that we were doing on the ancient supercontinents, I think, uh, is, our, that is actually scientifically testable as a hypothesis. So this did make a media splash just about uh, two years ago this week. Um, my, two of my graduate students were my co-authors. They were first and second author. And they were able to handle all the media um, frenzy. Um, New York Times did a very good job and suggested now we're looking down at the South Pole with both the current grid of, of continents and the future motion of closure of the Arctic Ocean, the ancient location of the center of Pangaea off on the equator underneath Africa, and the three predictions that we set up were that either the next Pangaea um, would form back where the old one was or would go the all the other side or we would have this intermediate one in between. Now, if any of you have done anything that has captured media attention, you can uh, take all of these posts and, um, and find your harshest critics on the internet. So um, we have uh, one critic who s suggested that some PhD student got a five-year grant and $100,000 salary per year for the study's findings. I think um, we're still striving to give our PhD students $100,000 a year. <laughs> Far from it. Um, so we have that criticism. We have another criticism from, from this gentleman who um, 
was just flabbergasted at the paucity of intelligence to think that such inelegance could arise from Yale University. Uh, but then I think he kind of gives himself a little discredit by suggesting that thermodynamics second law insists that could not happen. Um, and um, so anyway, you really get a good reality check on, on the, fra the societal framework of your science when you actually do make a media splash. Um, however, there are some more positive um, uh, assessments, and I'm always going to be grateful for, for this lady who um, has uh, rendered her uh, actually rather quite, quite positive <laughs> opinion about the work. Okay, so um, we continue to make progress in these fa past and future motions, and now I want to return to the final aspect um, of the talk which is thinking now about the billions of years of evolutionary uh, history and tectonic history of the Earth, thinking about where humans fit in, in this all. So we will return to the time scale and remember that uh, humans come on the scene in a very broad sense with our Australopithecine ancestors at 8.10 p.m. Um, actually on the same kind of calendar year analogy time scale, uh, the countdown, the New Year's Eve countdown, would actually go 150 years per second. So if you, um, if you would allow me, uh, it would go something like Gutenberg, Renaissance, Enlightenment, Industrial, Happy New Year, right? <laughs> so 150 years a second. Um, and so I, I gave you a poll at the beginning of the, of the lecture of 50,000 years into the future, because 50,000 years ago is, according to uh, some anthropologists, about the time when we started to really emerge from our uh, more primal roots, uh, developing some music by that time, uh, starting to um, uh, work our way towards, um, certainly control of fire, to work our way towards domestication, um, a little early before that. But so 50,000 years into the future uh, is enough time to really think about, well, this, this could be a really long-term um, prospect for thinking about the human race. And I'll now register some of my own opinions about uh, these six possibilities. The first one, the natural extinction by meteor impact or supernova explosion, I think the chances, geologically speaking, the chances of that are very small on a 50,000 year time scale. In terms of man-made extinction, um, this is of course a real possibility, and, um, but I would like to, and, to pursue a more optimistic um, agenda than that when I think about my own um, you know, life's goals and so forth. Uh, trans, uh, religious apocalypse and ET civilizations I personally don't subscribe to. And then these, these, these two options for whether humans are going to survive either confined to the solar system or confined into deep, uh, expanding into deep space a la Star Trek. Um, actually, the nearest star is about four or so light years away. There are um, planets orbiting around stars that are, that are within, um, say, 10 light years from us. But the speed of light is so fast that for us to actually propel a vehicle to get there would take really, really long time. And I don't think 50,000 years is enough time to do it. So really, when we think about 50,000 years, my hope is that we will try to find solutions that really exist on Earth. Okay, we can talk about terraforming Mars and so forth, but that's very expensive. Um, and I think we really should have our agenda on sustaining ourselves on the Earth. And if we think now in terms of human history from on the order of tens of thousands of years ago to the present, and an estimate that I found um, somewhere on the web in terms of which I tried to fact check a little bit and it seems reasonable, uh, of human population going from zero up to seven billion, which we just surpassed, Basically, it's a very, very slow, steady rise until the Industrial Revolution when things take off. Clearly, it's the unlocking of what some of my colleagues have called nature's treasure trove of, of the consequences of four billion years of tectonic mixing and concentrating some elements, um, not only in terms of mineral resources, but also, of course, our fossil fuels that is allowing us to um, make technological advances and enjoy really unprecedented levels of prosperity globally that has allowed this population expansion to happen. And so um, we might think that a prior to that technological development, the more or less sustainable population, 
population on Earth would be on the order of 100 million people. Okay? The question is, as we think about moving far into the future, looking at a very, very broad timeline, another timeline from left to right, several thousand years from now, people will look back at us and say, this was the oil age. And that oil age is a little blip. All right? Will the far side of that blip be reflected in a precipitous decline in human population back to the sustainable level? I don't know. Or will our uh, engineers save us and harness um, renewable energies um, and recycle resources to be able to st um, sustain us in the long term? You may have heard about peak oil. Um, there's a lot of discussion about peak oil. Um, this is one rendition that comes from an introductory textbook that I use. Um, and this would be a more pessimistic view that we're already actually um, past the peak. Others will say that the peak won't come until another 100 years from now or 200 years. But regardless of when you think pink oil, peak oil will be, when you stand back on a 10,000 year timeline, the age of oil is in fact a little spike. And I think there's, there's no one who would argue with that. Because oil just doesn't continue down at depth forever into the earth. So let's talk about where those limited resources lie relative to what we might consider the, um, the economic growth of the planet. Um, and if the economic growth is tied at all to the consumption of resources, we can consider several projections into the future. First, we can look at, and I am not an economist, and I know there's many um, degrees of freedom in, in very, very simple models that I created with Excel in the last few days. So this is not fancy by any means. But its simplicity is actually an advantage, because I think I can understand the math that goes into this. So we'll start out with a level of 1 for today's uh, both uh, availability of resources and today's current um, consumption level. And let's suppose that um, annual economic growth, or economic growth in general, corresponds with a degree of consumption of resources. And it may not be a perfect fit, but it would be something along those lines. If you were an economist and you said, let's do 3% annual growth, that's a moderately healthy economy. It's not something that you certainly wouldn't be satisfied with it if you were a leader in the uh, People's Republic of China, um, where you'd be looking for more like 5 or 10% annual growth. But it's a, a healthy economy. But by the timeline of 100 years from now, that kind of consumption vastly outstrips any model of the available resources. The ideally optimistic endowment is the was a, I put as an upper limit, where we continue to find an equivalent of, of resources uh, commensurate with what we've used already um, every 100 years. Okay? Every 100 years in the future, we find the equivalent of what we've already um, are using right now. And I call that ideally optimistic. You could maybe have it slightly more. We could have a more cyclical endowment of resources that awaits us um, for, through further exploration. And this is actually just a sine wave, and you'll see that later on. Or you can have a dwindling endowment of resources. And of course, some resources will follow more or less the optimistic level. Some will be more cyclical, and some will be dwindling. Uh, I heard a fa fascinating talk yesterday by Tom Gradle um, on the um, question of will metal resources become uh, unaffordable to us in the near future. And I think his assessment was that the answer for some of those is yes. Um, we can see that a 1% annual growth also outstrips the available resources, according to any of these very simple models, on the order of 200 years. But this 0.5% annual growth is getting able to, to respond to those. What if instead, though, we go to 1,000 years into the future? Well, now the 3% and the 1% and the 0.5% annual growth are all zooming up with that kind of, of um, curve that expands almost to infinity. The ideally optimistic endowment carries on, but it's not nearly enough to keep up with 0.5% annual growth. Cyclical endowment keeps going on very, very low. And dwindling endowment uh, goes to zero. You could have a model which I think would be realistic for many resources somewhere in between, which would come up to some asymptotic value and then may be, be cyclical at some level in between this ideally optimistic model and another cyclical model. But let's now continue on the 50,000-year time scale, which I was asking you about with the poll at the beginning of the lecture. Now we have, with even our most ideally optimistic endowment, even that 0.1% annual growth has far outstripped the available resources within 5,000 years. And by even about 30,000 years in the future, even 0.02% annual growth vastly outstrips the available resources. So you can see with these kinds of curves that any kind of compound 
um, compounding um, annual growth will, at some point in time in the distant future, lead to a curve of that function relative to resources which are ultimately limited on the Earth. So this leads to the conjecture that truly long-term sustainability at any time scale into the future equals 0%, not 0.02%, not 0.01, strictly 0% economic growth. All right? And commensurate with that is that because resources are limited, we can't just throw them away. Um, we have to begin to co-adapt with our global environment and move on a path toward a nearly 100% resource recycling. Now, so that may be uh, sobering news, and uh, it could be very sobering news if we return to the thought of us here at our New Year's Eve party, um, because as we count down the, uh, the 150 years every second toward the future, we think, well, 50,000 years from now on this kind of time scale is not that far in the future. And if we're thinking about maybe a long-term agenda of the human race, if you're an optimist and you'd like to see some sort of sustainable development, I think we, it's just a matter of time before we migrate from the current growth-based economy until a, new, until a new model, which is essentially recognizing that the only sustainability in the long run is, um, is flatlining and recycling. So with that, I am happy to entertain your questions, and I thank you for your participation. <laughs>